Thank you. Got it. Welcome everybody, Islanders and off Islanders uh, to the Housing Action Task Force. We're thrilled tonight to be able to have Kai Frolich from Placemates Lease to Locals program here to present on how uh, her program works. Lease to Locals is running successfully in six of the Western ski towns and they've recently expanded to the Eastern seaboard. Uh, there's a privately funded pilot happening on Nantucket, uh, but most of the time it's a public private partnership so uh, before I turn it over to her, I just wanted to give everybody an update on the governor's housing bond bill, which some of you may have heard was released today to great fanfare. And I'm delighted to share that there is a transfer fee in the housing bond bill. There is also a seasonal <laughs> communities designation, which is absolutely thrilling for our region. It's not fleshed out, but it creates a, a policy group that will advise housing livable communities on how to create that designation. Uh, which should give the island, the Cape and Islands and the Berkshires the tools that we really desperately need uh, to tackle the housing crisis. And there is also accessory dwelling units by right across the state. Uh, it does allow restriction against short-term rentals, but otherwise it's fairly, uh, it's, it's a fairly open ADU bylaw. Uh, and then the fourth piece was it uh, makes permanent the, um, the housing tax credit, the low income housing tax credit, which is great. So that doesn't have to be renewed constantly. So a lot of good news and we'll continue to work with the state legislature and our legislative delegation uh, representing the island's needs to the governor. So, and with that, I will turn it over to Kai. Hello everyone. Um, this is an exciting day for, for Massachusetts housing. Um, Laura shared that good news with me earlier. So congratulations on, on all of you champions of housing. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, my name, as Laura said, is Kai Froelich, and I am a co-founder of Placemate. Um, and our biggest project is that we run the Lease to Locals program, which is a private-public partnership um, in high amenity areas, resort communities, seasonal um, towns, whatever you'd like to, whatever you'd like to call them. Um, so I will start with sharing my screen. Um, here we go. All right. Can you all see, can you all see this slideshow? Yes. Yep. Looks great. Okay, great. Um, wonderful. Um, so I am the co-founder and my official title is chief impact officer. Um, we're a pretty small crew of six employees. Um, and let me just jump right in here. So the way that this presentation is going to go, I'm just going to give a bit of a background on the business, how we got started, a background on Lease to Locals, how the program got started, um, do a market deep dive in our program that's in Summit County, Colorado, um, it's been suggested that's kind of the closest corollary to um, Martha's Vineyard area, um, and then talk about what it's like to bring the Lease to Locals program to a new area, specifically to Martha's Vineyard. Um, so my husband, Colin, and I moved to Truckee, California in 2018, um, and when we moved there, we knew because we had been visiting for so long that there were just tons of empty second homes, we thought, oh, well, of course, there's going to be easy. It's going to be easy to find somewhere to live. We had come from San Francisco. We thought, you know, we have it all figured out. Like nothing's harder than finding housing in San Francisco. And we found out that we were wrong and we didn't really understand why, because there was all of this empty inventory. There was some short-term rentals, a lot of the short-term rentals weren't even full-time short-term rentals. Um, we really started to unpeel the onion one layer at a time. And we realized that there just wasn't really a mechanism, even if people did want to rent out their houses and they didn't really want them to stay empty. There wasn't really a mechanism to find the right people to do that. Some people didn't know that there was a housing crisis in Truckee, and this was back in 2018 before the sugar rush of COVID. Um, 
and they would learn about these housing issues through a lot of the local businesses that they really liked and and they just there was just a huge disconnect and so we decided that we would start this business that was a housing marketplace it was a housing platform to connect empty second homes and underutilized homes with local employees in the area of Truckee, California, which for those of you who don't know is in the North Lake Tahoe region. Um, so we created a mission. We're very much a mission-based organization. Um, we're a for-profit, but um, mission-based and um, aspiring B Corp. Uh, so our mission is that through our trusted online platform, we connect local tenants with homeowners who have underutilized properties available for rent. To bolster this effort, we partner with local governments and nonprofits to incentivize property owners who convert their units into seasonal and long-term rentals for locals. And so the first part is really the placemate part. The second part is really the lease to locals part. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is our timeline of really how we got started in spring 2019. We have this proof of concept of how we were going to have this housing platform. Um, we partnered with the Truckee Tahoe Community Foundation to incorporate our business. Um, and then we were pretty successful in making some connections between homeowners and tenants. The homeowners would pay us like a matching fee. Um, we cr started to create a um you know, a pretty basic website where people could list their their places. We could do a lot of hand-holding and connecting them to tenants. And then COVID happened. We had no idea what that was going to look like for our business. Um, and we got connected with some folks at the housing department at the town of Truckee. And they said, well, we have this money that's set aside from transfer tax, from short-term rental transfer transient occupancy tax, the TOT, and what if we gave an, a, an amount of money to the homeowners and in turn they're renting locally? Like we just kind of bolster the efforts of what you're already doing. We said, that sounds good. We're willing to try anything. So we had this first public-private partnership with the town of Truckee um, word got out and then we got connected to the folks at the town of Breckenridge in Colorado and Summit County, Colorado. Um, and that was our first kind of national rollout in fall 2021. Um, that was our first out of California market. We didn't really know what that would look like or, or how that would go with us not being there, but it went really well. And um, so now we're across the country. So the lease to locals program, the program structure is that we convert existing housing stock to new longer term rentals for the local workforce, as I've said. Um, we provide property owners cash incentives to convert their properties into these seasonal long term rentals. And to be clear, we're not providing the cash. We are the administrator of the program that liaises between the participants, the homeowners and the tenants, specifically the homeowners who are getting the money and the towns or counties or whatever the jurisdiction or nonprofit partner, whoever that may be, um, because they often don't have that bandwidth. Um, and then we allow governments to quickly and efficiently address the critical missing middle housing needs so this is not a program for affordable rentals um, in the true affordable with a capital A. Um, this is not below 80% AMI. Um, this is really for people who fall in between the bucket of they cannot participate in the affordable with a capital A rentals because they make too much money. And in a lot of these places at this point in time, especially, they do make too much money because if they don't make that much money, they would have had to already leave over the last few years. And they also don't make enough money to buy in this really crazy housing economy that we're in right now, especially with high interest rates. And I mean, as as Laura said, it's really important to have these designations for these types of tourist towns like the Berkshires and Cape Cod and 
and the islands, you know, there are those types of communities in almost every state and they're just so different. The housing economics are, as you all know, um, are just so vastly different there. And so we just really need a mechanism um, to help that missing middle piece. Um, so we are very much like an arm of the housing departments or the zoning departments or whoever would otherwise be trying to do one of these programs. And there are a lot of these programs that have been tried, that people have tried to get off the ground themselves. And then they've kind of reached out for help and we've reignited their, their programs, which is really great. And I'm so happy that we're, that we're able to have those partnerships to do that. So here we go. So here are the markets that we work in now um, with the timeline of when they've launched. So our first program was launched not yet three years ago um, in Truckee, California in November 2020, right at the beginning of COVID. Um, and then it was Summit County, Colorado in partnership with the town of Breckenridge, South Lake Tahoe and Placer County. Placer County is um, like the north side of Lake Tahoe. Ketchum, Idaho, most people know um, their neighboring town of Sun Valley, and then Eagle County, Colorado, um, where Vail is located, and that was one of the programs that we restarted for them. They had started their own program in June 2022 and had gotten interest from, I think, two homeowners in a year, and then we, and then they asked us to help them restart the program, and, and now it's gone really well. We're very happy with the progress that's been made there. And then Nantucket, as Laura mentioned, um, we just launched our first Eastern Seaboard Market. Um, my husband, Colin, and I have actually moved to Portland, Maine, so we're much closer um, to these East Coast communities, which we're very happy about. Um, and we just launched Nantucket on September 1st, um, and it's been going really well so far. We're also in touch with um, many other East Coast towns. So um, some Vermont mountain towns, some coastal Maine towns, um, and kind of everywhere around the country, really. I just I just had a call with, with someone on Vashon Island, Washington. So really, this could work anywhere. Um, okay, so our overall results um, to date, since November 2020 until this month, we've unlocked 367 units across all of our markets and housed close to a thousand people. Um, and because we are really the customer face of this program, um, or the customer facing piece of this program, we've talked to almost 2,500 property owners. Um, that's how many people we've answered the phone with emailed with, um, texted with, answered every question imaginable, have had hours, sometimes hours long conversations, hearing people's life story and the story of their house. And, you know, we've really gotten a lot of great data and, and really have begun to fully understand what it takes for someone to really dip their toe in the long-term rental pool as a landlord, which is um, very valuable information as we launch more markets. So now I'll dive a little bit deeper into our program with Summit County, Colorado. Um, as I said, this is um, technically two markets in one. Um, so it's the Summit County Housing Department in partnership with the town of Breckenridge. The town of Breckenridge is within Summit County. Um, and so they've decided to do this program together. That very rarely happens, I've learned. Um, but but it's been a, a really wonderful partnership. I just had a meeting with them today. Um, and so that has been going on for, we just hit our two-year mark. So in each market that we work in, we have different program guidelines. So because we have all of these lessons learned from our other markets, we're very good at going into the new markets and um, helping craft the program guidelines based on the nuances of the 
market dynamics and um, the dynamics of the town, the dynamics around the workforce, the dynamic around the the housing inventory of a particular place. The program guidelines are generally all very similar, but they're all somewhat different because they have to be, all of these places are somewhat different, even though they're all high amenity resort areas that have a lot of the same issues. So the program guidelines in Summit County is that a, pro a property must be located within the incorporated town of Breckenridge or an unincorporated Summit County. So it can't be located within an incorporated other town within Summit County. Um, otherwise that, that town would have to also be participating in the program. Um, the property must have been an active short-term rental for at least the last three months in order to participate. The reason why that is the rule in Summit County is because that is where the money was allocated specifically from TOT funds. And so they wanted to make sure that this was specifically targeting short-term rentals. They were not interested in houses that were just empty or underutilized otherwise. That is not the case for all of our markets. Um, leases can be seasonal, meaning six plus months or long-term 12 plus months and subject, subject to rent caps, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, the incentive amounts vary based on length of lease and size of the unit, and they have been up to $22,000. I think actually in the first iteration of the program, they were up to $24,000. That is no longer the case because we're shifting with the market dynamics. These are, when we first launched was in October, 2021, at the height of the sugar rush for short-term rentals in ski towns and frankly everywhere. Um, and so we had to go with super high numbers. So now the highest, the, the largest amount that you can get in Summit County is $16,000. Um, and they've just been lowered based on the fact that the short-term rental market has been slowing down a bit. Qualified tenants must be locally employed within Summit County physically at least 30 hours per week. Um, and again, these are somewhat different in each market. In some places, you only have to work 20 hours per week. In some places, you can work outside of your county so long as you're within the school district. All of these things are are different levers that can be pulled. Um, all of the bedrooms must be filled with qualified tenants. Exceptions are for disabled people and caretakers. So parents or, or caretakers of elderly parents. Um, in the current rev of the program, um, there are, these are the current incentive numbers. So for a seasonal lease of six plus months, you can get four to $8,000 um, for a two or three bedroom. We basically have just decided that that's gonna be the same because there are very few three bedrooms that participate. Eight to $16,000, four bedrooms are, are larger, can go up to 18,000. And then over on the right side of the table, there's a rent cap per bedroom. Um, and you can see what those numbers are. Um, the leases cannot end between November 1st and March 1st. And that is a nuance um, within Summit County because it's so seasonal there and the winters are so rough. And this is similar dynamics to all of our mountain towns, although they're the only ones that have this rule, which I think is actually pretty smart, which is that it is just near impossible to find a lease in the middle of ski season and nobody wants to move at that time. So you can just, all of the markets can really go at it with whatever program guidelines that they have. We'll, we'll definitely, we try to steer people in the right direction. Um, so this is the results that we've had to date. The property owners, we've talked to four, close to 500 total homeowners. Um, 213 of them have been not qualified. Half of that is because they were not a short-term rental beforehand. 25% um, of them was that they were already a long-term rental. And this is 
a point of contention sometimes when we launch in a market and there are people who come out of the woodwork and say, but I've been doing quote unquote the right thing this whole time. And that is absolutely true. And we hear those people and we talk to every single one of them. And what we're doing is we are starting to craft in some of our markets, a preservation program, which is um, a similar incentive program, maybe with some lower, slightly lower incentives to incentivize the folks who have been doing the right thing this entire time to continue doing that. Because as much as we want to be converting um, housing stock into new long-term rentals, we also don't at the same time want to be losing people from the long-term rental pool that does exist already. Um, and then 25% um, that weren't qualified were out of the area outside of the either incorporated town of Breckenridge or outside of unincorporated Summit County. Um, so, so far we've completed 114 properties. 70% um, have so far renewed for a second year. 32 seasonal and 82 long-term um, meaning they given the opportunity, they'll they'll take 12 plus months. Um, and we've actually seen that that's pretty consistent with um, our other markets that even though a lot of people think, oh, I don't really wanna go all the way into 12 months, I just wanna do a seasonal lease to start, that that they've actually found that maybe it just makes a lot more sense just to, just to jump into 12 plus months right from the get go. Um, so we found that the tenants that have been served, there have been 228 total people housed. Um, $1,200 is the median rent per bedroom. And the median rent per unit is $2,400. Most of the units are two bedroom, two bedroom units. Um, the budget because this is always a big question, um, how far does your money go? So 7580 is the average cost of the incentive per bedroom. The $10,905 has been the marketing, and that's been the amount of marketing that's been spent since October of 2021. So that's not an annual, that's since the beginning of the program. All of these numbers are since the beginning of the program. 222000 has been paid to us directly for all of the administration. We also do all of the marketing. So the $10,905 that's been spent on marketing is just a reimbursement of the ads that we've been purchasing. Um, but we work with designers that create all of the ads. We figure out which publications to be putting these in. We do um, big mailings with postcards to people's tax paying address, not to their second home address because they're not there to receive their mail. Um, and then, so that's part of our admin fee. Um, and then the $1.6 million is the amount of grants that have been committed most, or I would say about Mm, two thirds of that have already been paid out fully, whereas about a third of it is yet to be paid out. But that's what has been committed because we pay half of the money up or the jurisdiction pays half of the money up front to the homeowner at the beginning of the lease and then half at the end just to make sure that we're getting kind of good behavior throughout the program and people aren't just going to take the money and run and kick out their tenants and sell their house. Um, this is just some feedback. I'll just give you a second to to read over it. I won't read it for everybody. Um, but we've, in general, had some really great feedback from both the tenant side, the homeowner side, and also the employer side. And um, that's really a big part of, of what led us to this business is that when we came into the town of Truckee, we talked to a lot of business owners and so many were struggling and said, I've lost so many employees to housing. And we all know that that's just increased over time and, and with COVID um, and even now in this kind of new post COVID era um, and the housing is the housing piece really doesn't help. It's, it's really challenging and it's even more challenging for Island communities because there's no, secondary market that you can just kind of move to. Like there's no Reno to Truckee. 
you know there's um there's no like denver to summit county there's just nothing like that available So this is the average AMIs by market. Um, some of our markets do have an income cap. That's one of the program guidelines that is completely up to that jurisdiction um, based on the tenants that, are, that they're trying to serve um, and who really needs the most housing. So in Ketchum, Idaho, and South Lake Tahoe, the income cap is 120% AMI. In Truckee, it's up to 150% AMI. And then in Eagle County, South Lake Tahoe, and Summit County and Breckenridge, there is no income cap. However, all of these, and I said this before, all of these markets, you do have to work locally. That is that is truly the reason for the program. Um, and then it's funny because we thought that even with really high income caps, we would get, that with really high income caps, we would we might get people who are just making too much for this program to truly make sense. Maybe they should just buy. And we're seeing that the average household AMI is generally over 80%, except for in Truckee and Eagle County, um, which is good. The over 80% means that those are people who would not have been able to be reached by affordable housing um rental assistance programs or affordable housing, um, like HUD affordable housing units that are available and oftentimes not available. Um, and I do know that the Duke County, the Dukes County um, rental assistance program does have a waiting list with folks that are up to 130% AMI. And so um, I, I do think that this is a really great program to layer on to other programs that already exist that just kind of opens the door for for another section of the of the community um and these are the retention statistics um the market the markets in ketchum has been our highest retention so far um with 83 percent um and that is even though this is a one-time program there. And that is the same with South Lake Tahoe, Truckee, and North Lake Tahoe. This is only a one-time incentive program. Our hypothesis when we first started this program was that people needed to really dip their toe into the seasonal or the long-term pool. And then they would really enjoy doing long-term renting as opposed to having their house sit empty and having the decks collapse from too much snow or having to deal with the turnover and not enough cleaners um, with the short-term rentals and too much wear and tear. I know that long-term rentals, people get worried about the wear and tear, but the, the way that you kind of maintain your house is different when you're really living there than when you're on vacation. And, and I think that a lot of people see that and they're really pleased. And so we've had pretty high retention, even though this is a one-time incentive. In Summit County in Breckenridge, we have had, 64% is a little bit old. We've had closer to 70% renewing, um, but it's all about two thirds to 75%. Um, for the retention statistics for this program. And again, it's totally up to the jurisdiction. Eagle County and Nantucket have both also said that this is going to be a continuous program for them, but um, we don't have the renewal percentage because um, they're still in their first year. And so we don't actually, we won't know until the spring for Eagle County how many are going to start renewing and until next fall for Nantucket when the, when the first year of the program is over. So this is when we come to what does it take to um, bring this to another area like Martha's Vineyard. Um, we say what when people ask what needs to be in place to launch. Um, well, one is that we need um, a pretty solid public jurisdiction or nonprofit partner on the ground that's going to be our main point of contact. And I, ideally, the one that's going to be um, housing the funds for the incentives um to be doling out to the homeowners 
Um, that being said, we also need the funds in place for the first year of the program by the time it launches and ideally for the first two years, um, just so that we know that there's some continuity in the program, even if it's not continuity with um, giving incentives for more than one year. Um, we do like to know that there's some continuity for getting new properties into the program for more than one year. Um, political will from the community and or elected officials is also pretty important. Um, it's good to have a uh, housing, housing forward um, community to be working with. Um, and often also because the, the elected officials are the ones who are going to be allocating money for the, for the program. So in terms of the program definition, the program guidelines, um, and I went over a little bit of this um, throughout the presentation, but um, the area needs to be, the jurisdiction needs to be defining the types of eligible units, whether that's existing STRs, like in Summit County and Breckenridge, um, secondary dwellings and ADUs, that has been the primary focus for Nantucket, where they do have the right for, for an ADU, um, and they've had that for a long time as part of their housing code. Um, empty homes, rooms, some places allow rooms, other places don't. It's really dependent on, on the majority of the, of the housing inventory in the area. Um, determining the incentive structure and the lease lengths, some are only year long, um, uh, sorry, year long leases that are allowed. Um, like in South Lake Tahoe, others allow seasonal rentals. Some decide that seasonal is five plus months, other places decide that it's six plus months. And then also deciding what the incentive amounts are, um, often based on the budget that's available. Um, and also taking into account what is a sh often, often the number, um, Basically, you arrive at the number because you say, well, how much is it for me to be able to rent out my short term, for someone to be able to rent out their short term rental, um, amortize that over a year, what's the rent cap that we want to have, and then what's the delta in between that, and that's generally what the incentive amount needs to be. Um, and then define the workforce, most importantly, and who needs to be served. So where the local employment needs to be, what geographic area that needs to be in, an income cap, um, and if one needs to be in place, and then also the rent cap. Um, so there's target property owners, um, basically deciding if this is going to be more for a year-round resident with an ADU or a secondary dwelling that's currently short-term renting. So that's, again, the primary, um, that's kind of the primary priority property owner in Nantucket. Um, and then potentially expanding to second homeowners with a secondary dwelling or an ADU that stays empty. Again, that's going back to, does this want, do we want to just be unlocking completely underutilized properties, um, places that are specifically um, short-term rentals or empty rooms? And then again, the, the example incentive structure, oh, sorry. Um, example incentive structure of targeting with the lease lengths of either 12 months or seasonal. Um, and, and this goes back to what I was saying before, that the incentive needs to be generous enough to be bridging the gap between the short-term rental and the long-term rental if what, what the program's goals are is to be really converting it away from the short-term rental inventory. Um, and then an example target tenant profile, this kind of goes back to, to the program guidelines in Summit County, but the tenant working full-time, um, working for a local employer, and that cannot, that doesn't have to mean like, it, you know, a Martha's Vineyard based employer. It could be a national employer or a regional employer that has a location on Martha's Vineyard. Um, and middle income, again, it's not an affordable with a capital A project. This is um, really for, for those folks who don't otherwise qualify for the low income um, housing or for, you know, a mortgage at this time. 
So now um, I've done a lot of talking and I would love to open up this presentation to answering questions from you all. Thank you so much, Kai. That was so informative. Can you take the screen share down so that oh, yeah, absolutely. everybody can see? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any questions? Uh, so yeah. yes, you've got your hand up and then Victor. Did you call on me? I'm yeah. Go for it. Thank you. What What is um, your experience? Thank you for a very, very interesting presentation. You're welcome. Um, and, and very efficiently done, I have to say. But what is your experience with people who um, live in a community but aren't comfortable uh, renting for five or six months uh, because they're going to have to move uh, mm -hmm. um, during a school year or otherwise? Um, have you had any reactions to that or with people needing to say nine months or 10 months or something of that sort? Yeah, that's a really great question. We do really want to avoid the shuffle, as it were. Um, and I know that that is something that people in a lot of these communities have had to contend with is especially for school teachers, like moving into a place, moving out for the summer when the summertime folks come finding a new place in the fall or moving back into that same place. Like that's not really what we want to do. And actually Nantucket decided that these are only going to be 12 month rentals. They do not want to have a seasonal option um, for that exact reason. The reason why it does work in some of these places um, like in mountain towns um, is that because there are two high seasons that's been really great for a seasonal option um, because some people will just come in for the mount or for into the mountains for the winter or they'll just come in for the summer for like the lake season. Um, and generally the people who are using their house or who are using their place as a short-term rental will do the opposite season. Um, that being said, if there's, I know that there are people you know, I know from personal experience, having grown up in Maine, that there are people who sometimes just don't come to their summer house in the summer. And so if there's somebody who needs a seasonal um, rental, because they're working during the high season in the summer, that's definitely an option. But you're right, it wouldn't really be a great option for somebody who has more of a year round position to be working to be to be moving halfway through the year. Okay, uh, Stephen, if you're all done, I saw Victor next. Um, thanks. I have, uh, in part, that addressed one of the questions, uh, of, at least in part. I, I think I have three, and thank you for the presentation. I, it's very clear and, and succinct. Um, it's an interesting idea. So one question is, how do you get your re re revenue? What's your fees? Um, how, do, how does that work? And wh what's the source of that? Um, um, the, the, the second question has to do, actually I can combine second and third. Um, it really has to do sort of with tenant management. Initially, what you presented was seasonal, um, vacant homes for which in the, you know, on the Island, there's anywhere from 40 to 60% of the housing stock. It depends on the community is vacant um or seasonal um so uh, the is the question of turnover or, or or shuffle um and and the other dimension of that question is what if a tenant doesn't move who manages that process yeah. um um related to that is is there any monitoring of tenant in terms of their capacity to sublet um, in effect, um, this could be an opportunity for two or three bedroom for a tenant to short term lease one bedroom. Mm. Yeah, so that those are all really great, great questions. Okay, I think I think that I have captured all of the questions. Let me know if I miss any 
in my answers. Thanks. So the first question um, being the our administrative fee. So that is baked into the contract with the jurisdiction. So the jurisdiction pays us directly. And in that slide where it outlines the budget from Summit County of how much has been paid to marketing, how much has been paid to us, how much has been paid to incentives. Um, we are paid directly from that jurisdiction. And so our fee can kind of go up or down. Basically, our baseline is $7,500 to $10,000 a month. And that usually starts about the month before the program fully kicks off because that's a month that's full of meetings and crafting the program guidelines, doing the marketing, doing the public relations piece in the ramp up to the launching of the program. Um, and then we're paid monthly throughout the course of the program, which is however long the contract is. Um, and- So it's that, not based on number of units or anything like that? No, no, it's because exactly. I think that, yeah. And part of that, it, we have tried doing that before, actually in our first iteration of the program with Truckee that we, um, when we first launched in November, 2020, we were doing it that way. We found that because like, for instance, in Summit County, we've unlocked 113 units and many of those units, we've actually done the administration for a second. And now because we're, we've just entered into our third year with them also for a third year, that's just a lot of administration in those 113, we've talked to almost 500 homeowners. So that's just a lot of work. Um, that goes into the program, basically figuring out all of the things that why people want to do this, why they don't want to do this, taking all of that information and distilling it and doing presentations for the Board of County Commissioners in the town of Breckenridge that isn't really well compensated with doing it per match, especially at the beginning when most of the work is happening. So that's the answer to that question. Thank you. For the second question with the um, with the shuffle, and I think that I kind of answered this before, but, le but let me know if, if there's something else that I'm missing, that yes, it doesn't really, it, it works really well for vacant homes or again, for, for like secondary units, like, like they have a lot of um, on Nantucket and hopefully with today's housing news in Massachusetts, they have more of. Um, on Martha's Vineyard as well. Um, so this would be really great for somebody who is wants to open up a room in their house, wants to open up their house because they aren't going to use it for the whole year, wants to open up an ADU, even though they live primarily in the whole home, or even if they don't live in the whole home, they come up enough that they, they don't want to get rid of their main house, but they would love to open up their their ADU or somebody who has been doing a short-term rental and is just thinking, especially this year where we've heard this in every community that we've talked to, 2023, this is not the same as 2020 and 2021. We're not getting the same amount of, um, we're not getting the same amount of interest for our short-term rental. It's a lot to manage the cleaners. It's a lot to manage the property managers we just, this would be so much easier if we just had reliable income, the incentive money to bridge the gap, and then, and then be able to do this either seasonally to start or um, long term um, for a whole year. Um, so that's kind of that, that piece of it. And then with people leaving, luckily, we have had not a single tenant like refuse to leave. We've also been able to really de because we are kind of in the middle a little bit. We're not property managers by any means, um, and we make that very clear. Um, we're not paid by the homeowners. Like that is not a part of our a part of our work. Um, but I think that we do kind of offer a little bit of this de-escalation because we exist between the two parties and because both parties know that they're involved in this program. Um, so luckily, we haven't had any tenants leave. We have also done some um, like landlord mediation classes where we and actually in Ketchum, um, if there is an eviction, like prior to an eviction, and this is not just for our program, but for any of the programs, 
there are rules in place that you have to kind of go through a tenant and landlord mediation session and almost all of the problems get resolved that way. So we do kind of have some tools and some lessons learned from different places, but you're right. Like we don't have any like legal footing for, for um, making tenants move or, or, you know, allowing landlords to kick them out. Um, and then with the sublease, we, in all of our, in all of the states that we work in, we have a standard lease that is used, that is recommended by the jurisdiction. And that usually comes down from the housing authority or one of the other longstanding programs that is in place. Um, one of the ways that we've been able to deal directly with allowing other rooms to be open is that um, in Summit County, for instance, the program guidelines stipulate that the number of bedrooms have to be filled by, like the number of tenants have to match the number of bedrooms. So they don't want, even though there's no income cap, so there could be like a doctor that comes in that makes enough money for a three bedroom, the rent cap being $3,600 for a three bedroom. And he just, he or she just wants one bedroom for themselves and to keep the other two open. That's not allowed in the program guidelines. The number of tenants have to match the number of rooms. So we we get around it that way. And, and that's how we've suggested to other areas that they that they get through that issue. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next we've got Bob and then Kim. Great, thanks. Um, Kai, thanks for the presentation. For me, it was fortuitous uh, because <laughs> two weeks ago, I was at a college reunion in Breckenridge. Oh. I had the opportunity to um, casually and informally interview three people who were extremely supportive of the program, even though two of them couldn't participate because they, because they had existing long-term rentals. Oh, oh, good. Okay. Great. And one of them did participate? Uh, the other one didn't have anything to do with it. She oh, was just okay. the head of the uh, museum there uh, oh, okay. on, on Main Street. Uh, oh, great. But one of the things that I did identify, which I think might be interesting here, is that Summit County is essentially the same year-round population as Dukes County at 20,000. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how that might equate and play out not sure. Uh, but I did bring back this Summit Daily newspaper that, Laura, I want to find a way to get it to you uh, because the headline, as you could hopefully see, housing projects move along. Nearly 500 workforce housing units are under construction, and mm -hmm. they have a target by 2028 to have 3,700 new workforce uh, housing units. So mm -hmm. whatever Summit County and Breckenridge is doing, it's impressive. And uh, thanks for filling in a lot of the blanks that I wasn't <laughs> able to ask in Breckenridge. Yeah, no problem. Well, that's great. I'm glad that you kind of saw it in real time. They're, they're really, they're truly such wonderful partners. They're some of my very favorite people to work with. Awesome. Kim, you're up. Hi. Thank you um, for your presentation. Uh, it's really helpful. Um, I just had a couple questions. One, I just want to be clear. So this is an annual grant. Someone signs up for a year lease, and if they sign up again, then they get another year stipend. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, for the for the jurisdictions that allow more than one year of the program, okay. like in Summit County and Breckenridge. Yes. And the other question I had is um, the enforcement. What happens? when a homeowner violates the lease and who how, who enforces that and who monitors that i mean it would have to be i would assume the the municipality would have to monitor make sure that the house is being rented as the lease stipulates mm -hmm. um and yeah. then if it's not and there's a violation of that lease who enforces that yeah, so that's a great question. Um, that goes back a little bit to what Victor asked 
kind of in the other direction of like what happens if the tenants are are bad um right. if the homeowner is bad quote unquote um so we have a couple of procedures in place and this is this is i think why we are particularly good at this one program um because we've been able to take all of these lessons learned and then kind of implement it as just part of the operations and part of the procedure. So we have a couple of things. One, we always check in directly via text and or phone call with the tenants that have submitted their applications to us and we've signed off that they're approved for the program. We don't submit the request for the homeowner to be paid until the lease start date. And we have confirmed with those tenants that they have moved into the property. So that's just like a quick, Hey, have you moved in? Like, I know that you have this lease signed, whatever. Um, that has, I don't, I can't think of any time that that's, that somebody said, Oh no, like they were just totally, um, playing you and they're just trying to get money. Um, but that just is kind of like a one extra step that we take to make sure that everything's in place. Something that Eagle County has decided to do, and, and we kind of talked them off a ledge on this, but they decided at the beginning when we restarted their program for them, they said, oh, but part of it is that we want to send somebody to every house and make sure that it is livable. And we said, okay, well, that's going to take a lot of manpower on or woman power on you, on your team, are you sure that you want to really bake that into the operations? I think that since we've restarted their program, we've done upwards of 30 properties. Um, and, and we just really wanted to like, uh, you know, instill in them that like that was really going to be very time consuming. They said, okay, well, how about we don't do that? But how about we say, we have the ability to kind of spot check the properties and we'll just pick some here and there and say in the contract that they sign with the jurisdiction, we'll say like, we are allowed before move in or like within two weeks of move in to just go in and check and like make sure that everything's kind of up to code. Um, and, and we suggested that was kind of a good happy medium. So that is also something that can be implemented. Another thing that we do is we have a check-in process that's baked into our operational system, kind of on the back end of our website, um, in which we do a midpoint check-in process with the tenants and the homeowners just to check in and say, hey, want to make sure that everything is going well, all the tenants are still there, you're like, for our own knowledge, are you all still working locally? Have you changed jobs? Um, is there anything that you want to discuss? We'll give you a phone call. So that has sometimes, interestingly enough, people just don't write to us on their own accord. But if you ask them, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I did have a question about this one thing. Or is it OK? You know, one of our tenants are moving out and they're getting a new roommate. What happens then? And then we have to um, requalify that that person who's substituting. Um, and then we also do a lease end check-in that's part of our process six weeks before the end of the lease, just to, again, make sure that everybody's been there for the entirety of the lease term, um, that everyone's happy with the agreement, see if they're planning on extending, whether or not there, there is an ongoing incentive, um, and oftentimes that will end up with somebody saying, oh, actually our tenants found a house to buy or they found another rental and they need a bigger place because they're having a baby, whatever it is. They'll say, what happens if they move out a month early? So then our standard procedure, um, and again, each jurisdiction could be different on this, but we just say, that's fine. We'll just prorate the amount of money that you're getting for the second half of your payment. Um, so those are kind of all of the ways in which we kind of check in with people all the way through the lease. And that's just baked in as a part of our process. And if they do, if they did violate, who would be the enforcement agency? It would be fall on the, on the municipality to file suit and go through the litigation process. And I'm yeah. assuming there's monetary damages. Yeah, we haven't, luckily we, ha that hasn't happened. Um, mm -hmm. Everything's been mediated out, but the only times that 
that there's been any monetary kind of retribution has been just when a tenant has either left. Um, yeah, it's really only been when a tenant's left and we've prorated that second um, amount of money. And homeowners mm. have been generally very understanding of that. They're like, oh yeah, well, if they're not living here yeah. for like two months. And do they have to months. provide um, pay stubs to prove that they're working locally? So the tenants do have to provide pay stubs um, upon move-in. We don't request, although we did used to, we don't request um, pay stubs at the end of the lease because there was really no, there was nothing that we could really do if they weren't working locally. And it really goes along with the way that almost all other housing programs work. You have to show that you're eligible upon move-in, whatever happens after that happens. Um, like for instance, with like section eight housing vouchers, you have to be eligible beforehand, but if you're going to live in that house for like four years, you happen to get a promotion and you go above that income threshold, they're not going to, they can't like follow up on those pay stubs unless you have to reapply. So, okay. Thank you. This raises yeah. the, just the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's so, it's so directly there's four parties involved in this, the the local whatever yeah. entity, you, mm -hmm. the tenant, and the landlord. Where's the legal mm -hmm. relationships? What, what, where are the points of legal accountability? Yeah, so the legal accountability is between is in is within the contract that is signed between the homeowner and the county or the, the jurisdiction, they have to sign a contract that is part of their homeowner application that they need to fill out and they have to fully docu-sign it. It's a legal binding document. Then there is also the lease, which is the other legal document and that is between the homeowner and the tenant. Wow, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry. That's okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so then we got Shanette and then Peter. I'm Shanette. And um, thank you for coming in tonight. Um, yeah. Victor literally just asked the question I was going to ask, but oh. I have an, another, another one. <laughs> okay. Um, in regards to, it says, um, What's the process of changing from, say, seasonal to a um, long-term rental? What's that process? How long would it take? What does that time frame looks like? Do you mean like if somebody signed up with yes. the program to be a seasonal and then like at, towards the end, they decided to extend to be a 12-month lease? Yes. Towards the end of the initial lease. Yeah, that actually happens all the time, um, which is great because it just shows that people go in thinking, oh, maybe I don't want to fully do this. I'm just going to try it. And then they decide that it's actually a really great setup. They love their tenants. And then they just want to continue. That can happen while they're still in the lease. Like they don't need to like move out and then move back in or anything like that. That can generally happen towards the end of the lease um, or at that midpoint check-in. They can let us know uh, we actually have already talked with our landlords or the landlords will say, we're going to ask our tenants if they want to stay. Generally, the tenants want to stay unless it's a seasonal job that they have and they want to leave. Um, yeah, so that that generally can just happen then. And then we would just, just like we prorate the incentive, um, we can also just extend the incentive. So we just work with the finance department or whoever it is that's issuing the money just to say, um, you can give them the second half of this money now, and then you can give them like the remainder of what they're due at the end of the full year lease or, or that's pretty nimble. We can, we can kind of set it up to however it works for all parties. Okay. Another thing is, um, I'm very visual. So if you could like yeah. example, paint a picture for me in summary of basically how long or what's the normal time frame it will take to launch like a process like this, say here, you know, say in Egertown, what will be like the process and how long will it take before it's actually up and working? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of times, um, you know, I actually joke about this with my husband, who's our CEO. I joke about this all the time when he's like, well, how close do you think 
you know, Jackson Hole is to launching. And I'm like, well, you know, it turns on a dime with any given email. Like it does, you know, it'll be like, oh, we don't have any idea. And then all of a sudden they'll say, oh, actually we have funding now that we can use tomorrow. That's never happened in Jackson Hole, um, but, but it could. So that all is to say that um, really a lot of times it has to do with like a committee voting on something or the town council voting on something or an election going through to allocate funds. Once the funds are allocated and um, there's a proposal that is sent to, a, for instance, the council or the board of county commissioners, they can vote on that and say, yes, we want this program to be in place. At that point, we can really start working as soon as possible. We have enough people on our team to add in one program at a time. We can always hire more people um, in order to support the number of programs that we have. Um, we generally would start a contract. And as I said, we usually work for about a month before the program launches. And that is just to set up all of the program guidelines, build the website, um, do the marketing, get it all going, and then really start like basically answering the phone, um, answering emails in earnest, starting on that program launch date, and then start processing those homeowner and tenant applications. I know that that's kind of vague and not exactly like a perfect picture, um, but basically the funding and the political will and, and kind of uh, voting entity needs to be there. And then from there, we can move as fast as, as possible. In Nantucket, where it's a private-private partnership, and I only say that because it's being funded philanthropically, um, I think that we met with them on May, in May. We actually went, it usually also involves some sort of visit um, where we do a lot of meeting with with whoever, what whatever board may be in charge. Um, and we met with them in May. We went into contract with them on July 1st. So, yeah, so it's pretty quick. Thank and to you, give you a sense, yeah, oh, sorry, and just one more thing. Yeah, one more thing is just to give you a sense of how quickly the program um, gets people into housing is that in Summit County, we launched on October 15th, 2021. And by December 1st, we had unlocked 30 rentals and 30, 30 different properties had been open for people to have moved into by December 1st. So it's pretty fast from there because you know you don't have to build anything. The housing already exists. Thank you again. Yeah. Okay, Peter. Okay, um, Kai, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with what you have accomplished in such a short period of time. Thank uh, you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm well known as a talker, and uh, I'm always <laughs> impressed with people that actually get things done. Uh, <laughs> um, I was interested from, the, from your very first slide about your initial partnership in Truckee, about what you were looking for in the entity to partner with, what was their charter, and why were and, and how did that work? And what have you learned about the entities that you need to that that are best suited to partner with you as you go forward? Because I'm sure you you've had a very very sharp learning curve. But I'm interested in what you were looking for at the outset and what you found in that uh, in that entity in Turkey. Um, that's a great question, and I wish that I had um, something a bit more sophisticated to say, but they um, actually asked us if, because we were already kind of doing this exact thing, but we were doing it without the incentive. And so we had to come up with the idea of connecting homeowners with local employees as tenants. We basically said, we want to be the Airbnb for long-term housing in tourist towns. They said, okay, well, if we have the money, we can bolster those efforts. We've definitely learned a lot um, on, you know, which partners are good partners and which partners are somewhat more challenging. Um, I would definitely say that towns are generally a little bit easier to work with than counties. We love working with counties and we work with many of them. There is quite a bit more bureaucracy that that kind of takes up a lot of um 
kind of gets in the way of processes. That being said, most of our partners are um, counties. And so we definitely know how to navigate that, but it is just, so, it, there's just an extra layer of complexity there. Um, we generally like to have a place where the politics are pretty pro housing um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the politics of the area in general, but like the politics within the, within the um, political powerhouse of, of the area. It's generally best if we're not kind of up against a brick wall um, trying to get things done. Um, it's, it's good to kind of have, you know, some encouragement um, as we, as we build this program um, and expand it. So that, that's kind of all I would say. I mean, we've worked with all all different types, but I would say, yeah, pro housing, good, um, and people who are just really excited to get this program off the ground. Um, you know, we offer a lot just in terms of adding a great deal of bandwidth to very strapped housing departments, um, and so people who are enthusiastic to work with us are are really great for for us. Thank you. It's yeah. interesting, of course, with the vineyard when you're looking at six towns. And, right, of course. And, yeah. uh, uh, well, we've done it all sorts of ways. All, as we all know, that the uh, entity that will be, uh, perhaps, shall we say, uh, institutionally diverse. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, next up, we've got David and then Stephen again. Um, David, you're muted, by the way. Where is it? There we go. Guy, it's been good to correspond with you. We never got around to that conversation. Um, oh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it, it has to be, right? Uh, yeah. A couple <laughs> of quick comments. Um, uh, our rental assistance program was first uh, designed and known as rental conversion. And it was okay. the same deal, uh, enticing uh, seasonal uh, renter uh, landlords into year round, and it was a full package of you know screening and and inspections and supports and what have you. Um, it's been over the years uh, refined, and you you've seen the explanations, uh, and so uh, uh, that's going to lead to my question. My other comment, as I'm really impressed with the municipal buy-in that you've had. Mm -hmm. our, um, our six towns, as you know, uh, from the sheet I've sent you, the snapshot are very supportive in using the CPA funds that are targeted for mm -hmm. housing in mm -hmm. this way. And yeah. we're gonna, and we're, you know, experimenting going up to 100%, the max is the changeover, the additional subsidy, all of that has to be done um, and is being done. But so far, the only commitment of the actual uh, municipal funds uh, for rental assistance as we do it has been in Oak Bluffs for a, a pilot program that the mm -hmm. uh, uh, we call the rental assistance 120. So it goes up to 120 percent mm -hmm. and um, signed, uh, finished up the, the first uh, such rental, a uh, new landlord, a uh, new tenant who is a uh, uh, town employee, which is very good. Uh, oh, good. And yeah, so it, that, my point is, again, uh, all power to those municipal centers of power, as you've said, and your relationship with them to have gotten that kind of buy-in. And, and I would suggest, as Peter mentioned, the six town thing, as you know, well, you know, if you get a town, who's excited mm -hmm. by this and goes ahead. That's wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, two towns, we call that regional out here, just about right. two towns agree. So, um, you know, good on you. And the last point is just a question to you. Having mm -hmm. looked um, generally at our rental assistance program uh, and understanding it uh, to the degree that you do, pretty well practiced, I imagine you do, understand it. it it's you started with the idea that this is might be complementary and i agree 
Um, just a comment or two from you on that, the comparison and the complementariness. Mm -hmm. If, for instance, um, you know, uh, Peterstown was looking at this, you know, mm -hmm. how would this fit? Well, contrast be an additional possibility. Yeah, so I think that, um, I, I will say, I don't know too, too much about about the ins and outs of the programs. But what I've generally, I mean, our general takeaway on housing solutions, especially in these kind of high amenity resort areas where regular housing solutions don't really work as well, is that you need kind of all, all the tools on the table. We're one of the tools. And if we can target a specific part of the population and the rental assistance can target another percent of the population. And even if there's overlap, like mm -hmm. I'm, I don't really foresee, I'm a pretty optimistic person. I, I don't foresee us getting to the point in the near future where we don't need more housing. Um, I, I don't think that we're ever going to like, you know, yeah. uh, work ourselves out of obsolescence here. So I think that, you know, my husband always says like, we're an arrow in the quiver, you know, like this isn't, we're one, we're one of many solutions. And I think that um, kind of like as many levers as you have to pull, it kind of creates this general pro housing momentum. And I think that like one of the reasons why we've been very successful in Summit County and the town of Breckenridge is because, and I can't remember the name of the person who had just been in Breckenridge. Who was that? That was Bob Johnston. Bob, Bob, that's right. Um, um, and, and the reason why Bob kind of showed that Summit Daily article that said, oh, they're about to have 3,700 new units. Like they're a very pro-housing um a community right. and they have a buy down program a deed restriction program building a lot of um housing for different incomes they've done a uh we're actually working with them on launching in the spring a new master leasing program for all of the local businesses that are 50 people and under mm -hmm. um and so i think that they're, you know, they, they didn't, they probably had enough programs under their wing when we first started this. And when we first started having these conversations, but they just really wanted to try everything and see kind of what sticks and, and what's really um, um, successful. And this right. has been a really successful program for them. And now they're thinking, oh, well, now we're also building all of this housing. Like, actually, let's move this more to a master leasing program or let's layer on a master leasing program. Like, I think that it's really important that at this time, especially with all of this buy-in that, that Massachusetts is getting on the state level, that we're just really trying and experimenting as many things as possible, especially with things that can get off the ground really quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Stephen, I think you're up again. I, I have just two small questions. Yeah. Um, the first is, is uh, it, you indicated that one of the options was not having any AMI limit. Mm -hmm. And yet there was also a per bedroom rent limit. Yes. Uh, and I'm not clear as to the reason for that, um, particularly where you have no AMI limit. The second question is is um, is is more hopefully the kind of thing that doesn't arise. But <clears throat> uh, all housing authorities and all people who do what you do, it, working as their agents, know that from time to time there are complaints, and sometimes their complaints are about discrimination in housing. Mm -hmm. And you see that issue coming up, and will you be in the middle? Um, uh, how do you address that kind of, what you're thinking about that issue if a program really takes off? Yes, um, I love I love that second question. I'll, I'll answer the first question first, which is um, without a rental, without an income cap, why are there rent caps? 
Um, that's a great question. I can I actually point directly to the Summit County program, um, where when we launched for the first year, we did not have any rent caps and there was no income cap. And that did, we thought that went hand in hand. And we got that suggestion from the housing departments, both in Summit County and in the town of Breckenridge, based on all of these programs, housing programs that they've been running. Um, what we found was that because a lot of, met, if we go back to the chart that I had shared, um, even without an income cap, they were hovering right around like 90% AMI was the average, but without an, but without a rent cap, people were still charging. Like we were starting to get um, applications in with leases that were like $2,800 for a one bedroom apartment. And like that just didn't, as a gut check, truly for the housing departments that we were working with, that just did not sit right with them. If people are still making around 100% AMI um, and paying something that really makes them cost burdened, they just didn't really see that as um, kind of aligning with the goals of the program. And so they decided that there needed to be a rent cap. Now, people often will just stick right to the rent cap. They'll be like, oh, it's $1,500 for a one bedroom. That's like not exactly what the intention is. People will just anchor themselves to that number that we throw out there, but that's fine. So long as they aren't going above that number, I think that we're okay with that. And we do see some people going below. Um, so that's the first question. The second question is about housing discrimination and Fair Housing Act. So we make sure that all of our employees are trained on Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, we are in the creation right now. We actually were just back out west um, in California meeting with our whole team and going through priorities for the next year. Um, one of our big priorities is to make more of a like self um like a user portal for homeowners that they can use and have a lot of tools at their disposal. Um, one of which is a lot of um, resources around mediation, should that need to come up? How do you deal with certain tenant disputes if that happens? One of which is also going to be Fair Housing Act and making sure that you're really following that anytime that a homeowner suggests that they're not following Fair Housing Act, whether or not they know it's part of Fair Housing Act or not. And most of the time they don't because they're first time long-term landlords. Um, we are making sure to steer them in the right direction and just saying per Fair Housing Act, you cannot be discriminating against people who don't speak English. And actually we have a tenant application that is in Spanish for that very reason. Um, that's especially um, useful out in Colorado and California. Um, and and also getting, uh, we want to keep creating resources like that for, for tenants from different backgrounds um, and of different languages. But also, you know, you can't discriminate against children. You can't discriminate if uh, somebody's married or if they're unmarried. Like you can't discriminate against groups of roommates versus um, a couple. And so... We are very clear and quick to to name that. And and because um, a lot of these people, as I said, are first time long term landlords, they simply don't know. And they get very kind of nervous um, when you start citing Fair Housing Act to them and they really make sure that they're following the rules. Um, so anytime that we see that, we we make sure that that's the case. We make sure that there's nothing in the lease that is. Um, that could be uh, violating Fair Housing Act. And then um, I'm, I'm not positive, I can double check on this, but I, but I think that all of our contracts that, or all of the contracts that are between the housing agencies and, or the housing departments and the homeowners also list Fair Housing Act. Yeah. Okay. I, I would just, I, I would do two comments to our colleagues here, and particularly to the um, uh, people in the affordable housing town committees, et cetera. Um, clearly, the, the, the uh, 
key requirement if there was interest in really pursuing this is an entity. There's two entities in this meeting. One is the um, uh, Dukes County um, Housing. The other is the commission. Um, um, otherwise, what really makes, I mean, we've got six city, six towns. Um, these counties don't mean anything here. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. Um, uh, uh, but but in in terms of uh, of uh, you know fun and in terms of tax responsibility and that kind of thing, totally. So, That's very regional. We found so, from East Coast so, to West Coast. So we've got six decision makers. If you're going to work with the towns, if mm -hmm. we're going to work with the towns, um, I haven't heard anything discussed about the potential for tax credit and or a differential tax rate for people who do this. That's possible in Massachusetts if you um, do a local option and, 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 and pass it. So that's something that, again, locally, if we we're going to pursue this, we'd have to think about. But the other thing that sort of intrigued me was the, um, your comment about uh, Nantucket doing this and philanthropically. And, you know, like one, one reaction is, oh, that's Nantucket. But <laughs> as we gave that a little bit more thought, um, we have the uh, community foundation of this vineyard, but 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 more and and there's a new director there who is probably interested in these kinds of activities. So it'll be worth a conversation with Paul Schultz. Um, uh, but in addition to that, we actually have a model of philanthropy that has been doing this, and that's MV Youth. Um, and the MV Youth Foundation has been, you know. 20 to 30 some odd people who committed $25,000 each for a X number of year period of time. And they've been doing a million dollars a year for youth related shovel ready projects. Um, that's not, um, they're not gonna convert their purpose. Uh, they're very focused mm -hmm. on that, but it's a, it's a model that says that that's possible here as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be worth talking, um, blocking a name to um, Lindsay, I think it is, at, at MV Youth, um, and in terms of um, some potential replication of that if we're really going to pursue it. So again, there's a local, I think it's, you know, just a couple of thoughts for us collectively. Great. Yeah. And I know that um, in Nantucket, what, so when we went out there in May, we met with the board of Act Now, and um, which is the organization that we're working with. And then we also met with the housing authority, the select, um, a couple of select board members. And um, they were very interested in the program. Generally, the idea that, that, everybody was kind of on the same page about was that if we want to do this quickly act now should just fund it for the first year and then the public entities can kind of jump can can piggyback on it um going forward and so i think that that is still what will happen likely um there just needs to be a few months of traction for for that to kind of get resurfaced with the public entities i will say that i think that it seems more sustainable in a lot of ways to continue doing this in a public partnership. Um, and hopefully now that um, Massachusetts has allocated all this money towards housing, um, that makes it that much more possible. I did wanna to clarify too, Victor, just cause I'm familiar with Nantucket. Um, part of the reason that ACT now stepped in is actually directly tied to the effort around restricting short-term rentals because they've been leading the conversation with that. So part of their stepping in to support this program is to be able to display to the community that it's not all about restricting, it's also about incentivizing. Right. So I think, you know, to speak to Kai's point, the program is not actually designed around private partnerships. It's designed as a public private partnership. And I think Nantucket's sort of an unusual situation because of the politics around short-term rentals there. Yeah. I agree. But to get it off the, I mean, to get it, I mean, to get it off the ground, if you're going to do it here, to get it off the ground, that, I, I mean, I would, in, in a reasonable period of time, because otherwise it's going through, you know, 
five or six or X number of town meetings, which are annual. Um, I, and and <laughs> the, I mean, we all know what kind of preparation and and uh, uh, support is needed to get a, particularly a, a warrant uh, um, uh, item like this um, understood, let alone approved. Um, it's it's a lot of work. Well, so I will say for any of the towns who want Kai to come and address your affordable housing committee directly, I know that um, Edgar Town's already reached out and Shanette setting, I think, talking with Kai to set something up. So, Victor, if, um, oh, Shanette's the administrator for, for Tisri also. I'm sorry, I forgot momentarily. But if any of the other towns want to set something up, I think particularly the towns who are looking at potentially increasing their percentage of their rooms tax, because there's a calculated amount if that passes that you'll be expecting to bring in. I know that's Chilmark, Aquinnah, and Edgartown uh, that I know Kai would be really happy to set those conversations up specifically with your affordable housing committees and or and planning board and select board if you wanted to do a joint meeting. And then Kim, yes. I know if there's interest in Falmouth, then you know I think you could definitely I'll share her contact information. You can reach out. Yeah, absolutely. Be and I appreciate it. Sorry. And I will also say that I'm going to be at the um, Housing to Protect Cape Cod Summit next week. If any of you are going to be there, I'll also be there in person. Yay, yeah. good. We'll see you then. Okay, great. Yeah, and if anyone here is attending, is anyone else here attending the Housing to Protect Cape Cod Summit next week in Hyannis? If anyone would like to attend, uh, I did just get word from HPCC that the Cape Codder has a special overnight rate for folks coming in from the islands and you can book just a single night at the Cape Codder. So if there is anyone who wants to attend, uh, you can let me know and I'll send you that information. I know Elaine Miller signed up from Tisbury to attend. I'll be going. And I believe Ariel Faria from IHT is going to be attending as well. And then there's a team from Nantucket that's coming and we'll see Kim there too from Falmouth. Any more questions? Well, we're right at eight o'clock on the dot. So I think I'll say Kai, just a huge thank you. And again, I wanna echo what everyone else said about the really the quality of the presentation, your you know, incredible ability to answer every question. So <laughs> I think it's a testament <laughs> thank to you. you know how well you've thought through this program and and uh, and you know how well it's being executed in all of these towns. So we're just really delighted to have you here. So thank you so much. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks so much for the invitation. We'll it was week. my pleasure to meet yeah. with all of you. Kai, would you kindly provide me with that PowerPoint? Because what I'll do is I'll send out Absolutely. the PowerPoint with the recording. And then I'll yeah, also- Yeah, I'll send that to you right now. Thank you. I'm gonna, Lucy and I will post the recording on the uh, Martha's Vineyard Commission YouTube channel on the housing playlist. So uh, I'll send that out to all of the, um, the admins and the chairs and the Joint Affordable Housing Group. And you can share that out with your membership. So please feel free to share that. It's publicly accessible. I think we're all set. Thank you guys Thanks so, so much. much. I'll see some of you next week. Okay. Bye. Good night, everyone.